Welcome back everybody to another reaction video and for the first time today we're going to dive into the channel Sabaton History. A lot of you have been recommending this and uh, I've learned about it from all of you and I thought it would be good to go back and start watching some of the Sabaton History videos that relate to the music videos that I've already reacted to and I thought this would be a really good one to start with. It's No Bullets Fly, it's the story uh, of Charlie Brown and Franz Stigler, which is a, a story that I first really learned about uh, from Sabaton's music video. And as I mentioned, if you didn't see that video, check it out. But uh, it, um, as I mentioned in that video, I learned over the course of watching that video that uh, Charlie Brown's bomber was a part of the 379th bomb group, which was the exact same bomb group that my wife's grandfather, uh, Corporal John Sabo, was in. He was a ball turret gunner on a B-17 bomber out of Kim Bolton, England. And it was in the middle of that video that I realized that there was a K painted on Charlie Brown's bomber. And I recognized that from photos that I'd seen my wife's grandfather in. And I only feel bad now that uh, he passed away seven years ago at the age of 91. In fact, yesterday was his 99th birthday. Birthday, my wife's grandfather and I only feel bad now that I didn't learn about this story during his lifetime so I could have asked him about it I bet he probably knew these guys uh, and he might have been in one of the other planes in that same formation so I'm excited to dive into this I don't know how much I'll really say uh, to add to this I usually try to add something but I think in a video like this they're probably gonna cover everything pretty good so we'll see I'm Indy Nidell I'm Pat from Sabaton and, and this, this is Sabaton, Sabaton history, history. Even in the depths of the inhumanity of World War II, you still find stories of humanity and yep. even honor between the two sides. Yeah, and thanks to the American author Adam Marcus, we found out about the story about No Bullets Fly. And that's a story I'm going to tell you right now, and then Paris going to tell you about the song. It's hard to describe if you see an airplane like this. So Franz Stigler. And for me, yep. it would have been the same as shooting at a parachute. I just couldn't shoot. And he, he, so he mentions there, I may be getting ahead of myself, maybe they're going to cover this, but he said it's the same as shooting at a, at a parachute. And as I was reading more about this after reacting to the last video, his commanding officer had told him, uh, I had better not ever hear about you shooting at a parachute or I will kill you myself. Uh, so uh, contrary to popular belief, he was actually, I think, following the spirit of an order given to him by his superior not to shoot helpless pilots on the enemy side. And so I give him a lot of credit for doing that. And as we find out later, uh, it was more than just him showing honor. He was actually risking not only his life, but risking an honor that he could have been given. December 20th, 1943, days before Christmas, and snowflakes spatter the windshield of Ye Old Pub, an American B-17 bomber flying 20,000 feet above the North Sea. It's part of an eight mile long bomber stream on its eight way miles to long. Germany. Jeez. Their target, a Focke-Wulf aircraft factory in the city of Bremen. Piloting a flying fortress, as the B-17s are known, for the first time is Charlie Brown. For the first who time? Has the lives of 10 young men. That was his first written mission? ...the bombardment group in his hands. They ready their 12 500 pound bombs. This month, the Americans will drop over 2.6 million pounds of bombs onto German industrial and military targets. And uh, the the group that he was a part of, uh, the 500 or the uh, not the 527th bomb wing, the uh, the 379th bomb wing dropped more bombs on Germany than any other bomb wing in the entire American Air, uh, Eighth Air Force. Targets. Shortly after 11 a.m., they crossed the German border, nervously on the lookout for enemy fighters, because if they can see Germany. So too can the German spotters see them and calculate their height, speed, and intended destination. Covering them as escorts are P-47 Thunderbolts, whose job it is to intercept the enemy. At 11.30, puffs of black smoke appear all over. German 88mm flak cannons are opening up, sending 20-pound shells into the air. Each has a differently timed fuse, so they explode at different altitudes. Interesting. The explosions rock the pub, and Charlie can barely see a thing through the smoke. Suddenly, a red flash explodes right before his eyes. The plexiglass nose of the plane is sheared off Ugh. and smashes against the windshield. Jeez. The men up front are unhurt. So now you can't ice see. Ice-cold winds now stream through the plane. The outside air temperature is Ugh. minus 60 Celsius. The shelling continues. Another red flash and engine number two is dead. Another <laughs> shell goes straight through the left wing before exploding further above. And on the right, 
Engine number four is damaged and spins wildly out of control. Charlie fights the controls to keep it from ripping off the wing. But yet another shell rips through the roof. Charlie's main focus, though, is now on keeping the plane straight. As the co this is his first mission. They had to fly 25 missions in order to be excused from further combat duty as a bomber pilot. And this is his first mission, and this is how it's going? Good night. The, the, what must have been going through his mind? i got to do this 24 more times if I survive today, and it doesn't look like he's going to survive today. Command to drop the bombs comes over through the radio. The pub gives a big kick as the heavy cargo falls on the smoking city down below. It's time to head home. The bomber formation turns back towards the North Sea. But the danger hasn't passed. They are still over enemy territory. Charlie's crew frantically scan the sky for enemy fighters, but the sky is empty of them. Not just the enemies, though, also their own. Now, none of the bombers have made the run unscathed, but the pub and the bomber beside them are seriously damaged. Charlie can see that the other plane is in bad shape, smoke pouring from two engines and dangerously losing height. The pub itself stays up, but it's reduced to two functional engines, and both planes have fallen way behind Too slow. as their yep. formation has flown on ahead. The other plane dives to try and put out its fire. It disappears behind some clouds, and suddenly a red flash catches Charlie's eyes. The other plane is gone. His co-pilot cries out. Dark gray shapes appear on the horizon. It's a squadron of Focke Wolf 190s closing fast. At the same time, a group of Messerschmitt 190s leap through the clouds below where the other B-17 has just disappeared. Charlie's men regularly probably met Messerschmitt 109. Two lead 190s aim for the pub's cockpit to take out the pilot and the controls in one attack. But Charlie turns and flies full speed toward the attackers, only presenting them the narrowest target while also shortening the distance between them. That catches the attackers off guard, and their bullets miss the cockpit and bounce off the plane's roof. Huh. Charlie's top gunner returns fire and hits a 190. It banks off on fire. The second 190 is hit by the nose gunner while trying to avoid collision. The Flying Fortress still has some fight in it. Now the 109s close from behind. The tail gunner tries to spin his guns, and nothing happens. The gun is frozen. frozen. Yep. Literally frozen. The winds blowing you through the plane have now frozen the oiled gun. The attackers close in. The tail gunner signals Charlie That's how and cold he jerks it was. the plane into a steep dive. Bullets ricochet off the frame, penetrating the glass of the ball turret beneath the plane and cutting off half of the rudder. The radio operator calls out for help but gets only static. Bullets have pierced the radio. 20 millimeter shells have punched through the plane and severely wounded many crew members. The tail gunner is now dead and all mm. of them are affected by the frost. Charlie fights just to keep the ruin of his plane in the air. Only one gun is still operable. Another attack, and the cockpit is hit, puncturing Charlie's oxygen tank. Tipping How to they the survived left, the all bomber this. spirals out of control. Faster and faster, it spirals downwards. Gasping for air, Charlie tries to get control, but the loss of the rudder makes that virtually impossible. Upside down, oh. Charlie's vision fades. As the bomber plunges towards the city of Oldenburg, Charlie comes to. The lower altitude has more oxygen. Mm. Immediately, he hauls on the controls, fighting the plane with all of his strength. At just 3,000 feet, under 1,000 meters, he pulls it out of his Ugh. dive. Too close right for comfort. the houses of Oldenburg, the plane is even close enough to shear shingles off the roof. Jeez. Charlie manages to pull the plane back up. At least what's left of it. Most of the crew is wounded or unconscious, only able now to fly 135 miles per hour, 217 kilometers per hour. Barely keeping it in the air. back to England, they will have to break through the German lines again. The dreaded Atlantic Wall, Germany's fortified coastline with the best anti-aircraft gunners in the world. Jeez. Charlie makes clear that anyone can choose to bail out. Being a POW is still better than being shot to pieces, yeah. but his men refuse. I and... Think my understanding is, at least for American POWs, uh, the pilots, I think, fared pretty well. Uh, you know, later in the war during the invasion uh, of Normandy, uh, there were some issues on both sides where German POWs were shot by Americans, American POWs were shot by Germans. But for the most part, at this stage in the war, I think the American POWs were probably treated pretty well. Certainly better than the German POWs were treated by the Russians and vice versa. Next to the north. They fly past the Jever airfield, where German fighter ace Franz Stiegler is about to start his engine. 
Just a day earlier, he brought down a B-17, and shooting down another one makes him eligible for the Knight's Cross. Yep. To France, though, this medal means more than just an award for being a killing machine. It means that there is sense behind his fighting, and that he has done his duty for his countrymen. Yeah. He has seen firsthand what the bombers have <laughs> done to cities like Hamburg and Bremen, yeah. reducing them to rubble. But his fight is not about hatred or revenge. It's about duty and survival. And that's a good point to put you in the mindset of this man, Franz Stiegler. This isn't a Nazi. This isn't somebody who's out there hating people. This is a guy fighting for his country. Uh, he's defending his homeland. He sees what these bombers are doing. Uh, nobody, nobody would blame him for wanting to shoot down one of these bombers. He, doing his job, like he said. Franz Stiegler learned his craft during his service in the Libyan desert, where he flew with the Knights of the Desert mm. and their star Fought fighter race, Franz Joachim Marseille. He has lost a brother to the war, hmm. he has seen the destruction of the Africa Corps, lost a brother. and then was caught up in the desperate fight for Sicily under Adolf Galland. He would earn his Knight's Cross by shooting down the flying fortress that appears now before him. He begins his attack run. But with his finger on the trigger and the enemy rear in sight, he does not shoot. They're not something shooting back. Something stops him. A feeling that something is not right. The lack of fire from the other plane makes him curious, and it is then he spots the damage the enemy plane has taken. He flies closer wow. and pulls Look up at that. alongside. Look at that. Stunned by the condition of the plane and how Jeez. he's still able to even fly. The only gun not destroyed is the ball, the ball turret, turret below, but it cannot elevate its guns high enough to harm Stiegler. I saw the tail gunner wasn't there because the guns were hanging down. Half the tail was missing on the, on the left hand side, practically no tail at all. Franz <laughs> knows that a few shots are enough to bring this contraption down, but there is little glory to him in shooting down a bunch of helpless men, even though their bombs have quite likely just killed his countrymen. Yep. He draws up right by the pub's cockpit. Now, Charlie's eyes are still fixed on the horizon, thinking of the flat guns at the Atlantic Wall. When suddenly a Messerschmitt appears right next to him, imagine how that felt. <laughs> I look out the right window, and there parked on my right wing is a German BF 109. Just as, and so I sort of closed my eyes and shook my head as you would with a nightmare. And yeah, you think this is it? Eyes and We're done. Open them again, he'll be gone. Well, I opened them again, and he was still there. <laughs> well, Franz waves at Charlie and points down, signaling that they should land, knowing that they stand no chance against the Atlantic Wall. Charlie shakes his head, and Franz knows that they are dead men unless he helps them. Huh. He told him you need, you need to land it. Pull over! Pull over! So that's gutsy on Charlie Brown's part to keep going. So he stays with them as they fly towards the Atlantic Wall. See, the experienced German spotters on the ground will easily recognize one of their own. Yeah. So as they fly across the AA guns, not a single one opens fire. Franz will wonder his whole life what the spotters think of that scene in the sky <laughs> that day. As they pass unscathed, Charlie does not understand nor see what Franz has done to help him until Franz Stiegler salutes, then banks away. Wow. And only as he salutes does Charlie understand. The pub makes it back to England, barely, and it is a small miracle that it manages a landing. Yeah. The commanding officer is about to award them medals for their service this day, but High Command gets wind of the story, how a German fighter pilot saved their lives, and High Command is furious. No uh. one can know that the mission never happened. Everything is swept Jeez. under the rug. no medals. Charlie and his crew are outraged, but that is that. Franz lands safely near Bremen, but he as well... Well, now I'm curious. I wonder, if did, I mean, the guys had to have at least gotten their purple hearts for their wounds. I can't believe they wouldn't have at least gotten that. But I'm curious. I'm going to have to look that up. I can tell no one what he has just done. This could get him court-martialed. Well, it could get him killed. If someone had seen him and reported him, it could have been a death sentence, a double. So he had the double impact. Yeah. Well, the story may have just disappeared into the mists of time. But according to the book, A Higher Call, which I'm going to read, a number of you have recommended that to me. Pilots to the 50th anniversary of the B-17. His first flights were back in 1935. Franz Stiegler was by then living in Vancouver, Canada. He was in attendance as 
pretty much the only German pilot and was interviewed by a local TV station and he told his story. Charlie, the same year, wrote to that old German flying ace Adolf Galland and the German magazine Jagerblatt trying to find out who his German savior was. It took until 1990 until they truly found each other and met in person after letters and 379th bomb group. So I looked it up because uh, I was talking to my mother-in-law and she said you know, that her dad always went to the reunions for the 379th bomb group and I have their book uh, that they got at one of the reunions and, and in fact Franz Stiegler went to two of their reunions uh, one in Massachusetts and I think another one down in the south somewhere um, maybe South Carolina, Georgia, something like that. Um, and so it's very likely that my, my wife's grandfather actually got to meet this guy because they brought him to these reunions and they actually made him an honorary member of the 379th Bomb Group. Startling story got worldwide attention. But you know, even after that, even so long after the war, Franz would receive calls from Germany calling him a traitor. Ugh. While some Canadian neighbors shunned him as a Nazi, mm. Franz always responded. No. They would never understand. I don't blame him. Franz, what were your feelings when you Honorable met man. Again, for the first time. I was so happy as we met that I dropped him on top of him. Good man, good man. It wasn't easy. It was like meeting a family member, a brother that you haven't seen for 40 years. That's <laughs> about as close as I can come. So, how did you hear this story in the first place? As usual, we are looking on the internet for ideas all the time. And I stumbled about a very beautiful picture, which is a, a painting of two airplanes. Oh, that's cool. And the picture is the front cover artwork of a book written by an American author called Adam Makos from Valor Studios. Right. When, when I saw this picture, I was like, what's the story behind it? And then starting to read, and it was like, wow, this is a great story. Yeah, this yes. is something we can do a song about. When we released the song, it was really interesting that I was contacted by a woman called Juvita Stiegler. Stiegler, mm. okay. And this is obviously the daughter of Franz Stiegler. Franz Stiegler. She wrote to me saying that her son who's a fan of Sabaton. That's awesome. That is so cool. That we wrote a song about his, his grandpa. grandfather. Wow. Huh. We had just announced a tour where we were traveling in North America. And uh, her family was based in Vancouver in Canada. Okay. And as we arrived, that is too it, cool. we met with them. I love That's it. That's really awesome, though. It's, it's, uh, I, I love the, the little bits of these stories, like when you met Audie Murphy's family, you know, when you meet the descendants and stuff. I yeah. like that. It, it's when our songs become so personal yeah, and uh, when we sure. get emotional about them because we also know that what we are doing is the right thing to do. You're keeping their story the alive. The fly is from the album Heroes right. and here we are referring to Franz Stiegler because he had the opportunity to shoot down an enemy but he didn't because yeah. And that is heroism. You don't, you don't need yep. your medals. Just yep. that, is, that is the It's a different of kind of heroism. Absolutely is. Look at those guys. That All is right, so well, cool. Ladies and gentlemen, that's No Bullets Fly. And this so uh, we've already reviewed the song, so I won't go back and uh, you know, talk too much more about that. But once again, just an incredible story. I love stories like that. It reminds me a lot of the American Civil War with Richard Kirkland, who is known as the Angel of Maurice Heights at the Battle of Fredericksburg, a Confederate soldier who jumped over the lines um, to bring water to enemy soldiers. I, I love things like that. Uh, you don't have to lose your humanity in the midst of inhumanity that man is capable of. Uh, and some people, it just it reveals their character. Franz Stiegler revealed his character that day in a powerful way. And I love this story. Uh, I can't wait to dive into some more of these. So if you have a suggestion on one you'd like me to do, uh, in addition to the ones that connect to the songs I've already touched on, please let me know in the comment section below. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button and, and the notification bell uh, so that you never miss another one of these videos. I would love to hear your thoughts on this story. Uh, use that comment section, hit that like button. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.